The words that Abraham Lincoln spoke in November of 1863 were a reflection of a larger debate that mid-19th century Americans had with one, with one another about how the federal government should properly honor the unprecedented number of lives that were sacrificed for the salvation of the Union. In many ways, Americans, and particularly the federal government, were forced to undertake a new relationship with death during the Civil War. We remember the Gettysburg Address because it became a reflection of this nation's collective suffering during a period of unprecedented bloodshed and national instability. For every word spoken in the Gettysburg Address, there were countless other diary entries, newspaper articles, commemorative addresses, and simple acts that were undertaken by everyday ordinary individuals to honor the fallen. The famous American poet, Walt Whitman, and the founder of the American Red Cross, Clara Barker, both worked in Washington, D.C. hospitals during the war years. Barton kept a series of notebooks in which she recorded the last moments of dying soldiers so that she could write to family members and describe their loved ones' last moments on Earth. While Whitman also wrote letters to family members of fallen soldiers. And it was that experience that influenced one of his poems, Come Up From the Fields Father. In that poem, Whitman sought to understand the mindset of families who received letters from him. He sought to put himself in their place. He writes in that poem of a small Ohio town where apples ripe and orchards hang. It was a vital and beautiful place, according to Whitman, until a letter arrived at the family farm that informed them that their son Pete had been mortally wounded. Little did the family know that by the time that the letter arrived, Pete had succumbed to his injuries. And then Whitman goes on to describe the impact that death had on so many families as the war dragged on. But the mother needs to be better, Whitman writes. She, with thin form, present crest and, bland, uh, cre uh, present crest and black, by day her meals untouched, then at night fitfully sleeping, often walking, in the midnight walking, weeping, long with the one deep longing, oh that she might withdraw notice, silent from life, escape and withdraw, to follow, to seek, to be with her dead son. Lincoln tapped in to this sense of collective mourning that Americans felt during the Civil War years. When he uttered words like, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground, the brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated, consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. He was speaking about the lived experience of soldiers, men like Union Colonel Luther Bradley, who tried to make sense of what they saw on the battlefield. Of all the horrors, the horrors of the battlefield are the worst, argued Bradley. And yet, when you are in the midst of them, they appall one as it would seem they ought. You are engrossed with the struggle and see one another go down and say, there goes poor so-and-so, will it be me next? Your losses and dangers don't oppress you until afterwards. When you sit down and quiet, uh, when you sit down quietly to look over the result or go out with details to bury the dead. The Battle of Gettysburg was one of those military conflicts during the Civil War that produced more casualties in a single battle than in any other war other than the American Revolution up to that point in American history. There were 23,049 Union deaths at Gettysburg. That does not include the number of Confederate deaths. That is simply the number of deaths among Northern soldiers. If we place that number within the larger context of all American wars before the Civil War, it's possible to obtain a basic understanding of why Gettysburg was selected as one of this nation's first national cemeteries several years before Arlington National Cemetery would replace it. There were about 25,000 American deaths in the American Revolution. An estimated 15,000 died at the War of 1812. And approximately 13,000 soldiers died in the Mexican-American War. So with the exception of the American Revolution, the total number of Union deaths at the Battle of Gettysburg exceeded the casualties in all other American wars, but more importantly, it approached the total number of deaths in this nation's war for independence. 
But this still begs the question, why was Gettysburg selected as one of this nation's first national cemeteries? The answer to that question began in 1862, when Congress was forced to deal with the logistical problem of how to handle the growing number of dead bodies that were produced as the Civil War dragged on. In November of 1862, Congress empowered Abraham Lincoln to, using the words of the legislation, purchase grounds and cause them to be securely enclosed to be used as a national cemetery for soldiers who died in service to their country. The Battle of Gettysburg was one of the few battles that was fought on northern soil. So it made the issue of how to deal with a large number of soldiers who were killed in battle visible to people living on the Union home front. In the weeks after the battle, a committee was formed and money was raised to purchase land that would later become Gettysburg National Cemetery. $1.59 was spent to rebury each soldier in a grave at Gettysburg National Cemetery. And the graves were designed to be exactly the same in every way to convey the message that all soldiers mattered equally, regardless of rank or station in life. Beginning with the dedication of the Gettysburg National Cemetery, honoring the fallen took on a new public importance that would continue to evolve straight up through the present. The basic concept of identifying fallen, so fallen soldiers comes from the Civil War. By the end of 1864, the Union armies were, in some cases, losing 50,000 soldiers in a single month. Soldiers began, at that point, to pin pieces of paper with their names and addresses on their bodies, or carry family Bibles with their names inscribed in them, so that if they died in battle, their bodies could be returned to their families. By World War I, this practice would evolve into soldiers wearing dog tags so that bodies could be identified and buried. After the Civil War, Robert E. Lee's land was confiscated and Arlington National Cemetery became uh, what, up through the present, continues to be what we know as our National Cemetery. The method by which soldiers are buried at Arlington holds true to principles that were established at Gettysburg. The cemetery is arranged so that every grave is of equal importance. Thus, the long rows of white tombstones do not indicate social rank or military status. On November 19, 1863, Abraham Lincoln helped to establish the basic framework for how this nation honors its war dead. But approximately a year and a half later, he became the source of public commemoration. After Lincoln was murdered in April of 1865, a train carrying the body of the slain president slowly meandered back towards his final resting place in Springfield, Illinois. In towns and cities throughout the North, individuals gathered in public commemorations for the slain president. One of the most touching moments came in Poughkeepsie, New York, when Matthew Vassar, the namesake of Vassar College, entered Lincoln's funeral tr uh, train with thousands surrounding the small hilltop train depot and placed a bouquet of magnolias that he personally cut from his own magnolia tree on Lincoln's coffin. So I submit to you that it was the Civil War that forced this nation to come to terms with how to pu publicly commemorate the fall. It was at Gettysburg that Lincoln, as President of the United States, sought to commemorate the war dead in a way that was unprecedented in this nation's history up to that point. After 150 years, I think the true significance of the message Lincoln communicated through the Gettysburg Address and the very act of establishing a national cemetery is best summed up by historian Drew Faust. Faust argued, we still struggle to understand how to preserve our humanity and ourselves during times of war. We still seek to use our deaths to create meaning where, uh, where we are not sure any exists. The Civil War generation glimpsed that fear that still defines us. We still work to live with the riddle that they, the Civil War dead, and their survivors alike had to solve long ago. So, thank you all for coming out. Thank you for commemorating with uh, the History Department and the Center for Historical Research this event.
and uh, again, uh, think about really more than just the Lincoln on days like today, think about why it is that we actually honor people who serve for this country. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris. That was very interesting. Actually, we are kind of a small audience, but um, perhaps it's unfortunately indicative of students' knowledge of, and people's knowledge of the Gettysburg Address in general. Um, I was talking to Professor Perry, who announced this in his class uh, this morning, and he said four students had heard of the Gettysburg Address, two knew what it was, in a government one on one which is kind of a scary thought. So literally, in a class of 30, four had actually heard of the Gettysburg Address, um, which is why events like this are so important uh, and for people to understand what these are all about. Um, last Friday in class, I, asked my, I gave my students in two Fridays ago an extra, extra credit question. Um, asked them, what's the original name for Veterans Day? I got Memorial Day, uh, All Saints Day, St. Patrick's Day, but nobody actually knew what it was. Armistice Day. Well, I'm sure everybody in this audience knows, <laughs> but you know, no one knew that. And so, and then, what was it commemorating? That was another one that they had no idea. Um, and what the armistice was for. When I told them, it was one student who the treaty. But uh, so. This is really, these are really important issues in history, American and otherwise, that uh, we need to keep alive. Uh, basically, Chris is willing, to, if you have questions, um, Chris is willing to answer them, field the questions, and turn this into more of a discussion. But thank you all. I'd like to say thank you for those who have come. Okay? And again, thank you to Chris and our readers, Joshua and Lee. Yeah, I mean, Arlington National Cemetery is uh, kind of the, for lack of a better phrase, the ultimate F U two to the people who fought for the South. Um, Robert E. Lee was the commanding general, of course, of the Confederate armies, and so his land is confiscated by the Union government. And then after the Civil War, it, it becomes a symbol of all of the Union debt. Um, that he helped kill during the war years. So uh, his actual property uh, becomes a national cemetery, what we still consider a national cemetery. So in a lot of ways, we think that things like the Civil War are divorced from how we think about our current society, but in many ways, the Civil War establishes how we think about very basic things, like how do you commemorate people who died for a nation in the case. In this case, our nation. And what time Gettysburg it was to be a national cemetery? Right. I have been there, obviously, I probably met this question. So, what I know that it's um, the National Park Service obviously doesn't need to go and visit, but is there an, are there any remnants of its days as a national cemetery? Yet? It's still all there. Yeah, it's still all there. It's still all there. We don't know the exact spot that Lincoln spoke from. Uh, the monument that they have there states that. It says that, you know, this is where we think he spoke. Um, but uh, the cemetery is still there. And actually, Gettysburg is not the first national cemetery. And the battlefield at Antietam is actually the first national cemetery. Gettysburg is the second. Um, but it is the first that a president speaks at in terms of commemorating the war dead. So that's why Gettysburg is held up in terms of such national significance. It was such a great speech. Yeah. yeah. Prior to these national cemeteries, what do you think what 
Uh, it tended to be based on families bearing their own war debt, but besides that, the idea of burying soldiers uh, together without designation of rank or social status did not exist. The government really only buried officers uh, and commemorated officers. Others, it was left up to a whole host of factors of whether buried one at all, or, right, or whether family members actually ended up getting a body and burying them in a local cemetery. Um, and so during the Civil War, they begin to, as I uh, kind of alluded to in my statement, uh, they begin to take up this issue of how to actually bury large numbers of bodies because you have instances where you simply have thousands of bodies rotting in open fields. And there is a great debate uh, in the North and the South, but much more so in the North, about if you don't actually come up with a means to bury the dead, what is the difference between human beings and animals? Uh, and so there is this very, very deep, very painful debate that goes on about you know, the number of people being lost and how they are not being honored for trying to save this nation. Uh, it is not Lincoln that establishes Memorial Day, actually. In the aftermath of the Civil War, it becomes Decoration Day before, long before it's Memorial Day. And the idea comes from decorating the graves of the fall. Uh, and the actual idea of Memorial Day is established uh, in 1868 by a Union veteran who becomes a congressman, John Logan, but it becomes tied up with post-Civil War politics about not forgetting those who fought, those who died in the Civil War and what they fought for, which was to subdue the South's rebellion. It initially is a distinctly Northern holiday, but then with time, it really becomes a, uh, it really becomes wrapped up with how do you tie the North and the South back together in a single nation? And by the late 1800s, uh, Confederate graves are being decorated by the national government as well. So it is it really becomes a question of big uh, politics by the late 1800s, and how do you um, you know, come back together as a nation after something as bloody and deadly as a civil war that kills 2% of this nation's population.